Okay, welcome. We are normally in 2 Corinthians going verse by verse. And as I, as I was preparing the verse by verse, this has been the model that we've had at campus. We take a book of the Bible and we go verse by verse. And I, we did it through Revelation. If we hadn't have gone verse by verse through Revelation, then I never would have learned how to explain uh, what we're going to cover today. I wouldn't have had the background to be able to do it. But now that we've done it, I've been benefited. However, I started going verse by verse a couple weeks ago in preparation for 1 Corinthians, which we're teaching in Milk. And I realized verse by verse is good, and I'm going to continue to do it, but not with the same sort of approach. Why? Because in Milk, for instance, we've covered the Gospels, and we've covered Acts, which are historical books. And so there's no reason that for us to worry too much about things within those books because they're telling us what was, it's obvious that's what was, and so we just teach it and go on with it. But now that we're in 1 Corinthians and Milk, we're coming across some larger bites of information where an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ is giving um, recommendations. He's actually giving commandments and intole in the Greek. And he's telling them, listen, women keep silent in church. Does that have application to us today? Well, in some churches in certain Amish, it might. But pretty much we've done away with that. Somehow we've done away with it. We've said, you know, women can, not, can speak in church. Somewhere along the way we've said what the apostle said to the church at Corinth doesn't matter. He said, a woman, it is a shame for her not to have her head covered. So uh, somehow we've gotten away with that. I'm looking at, at the heads of two be three beautiful women right now, and their heads are uncovered. Shame, shame, shame. How have we got to the place where the New Testament directives don't have a place for our church today but and where do we justify it where do we say it's not okay it's okay this is acceptable this is not and you know what the problem is every denomination does it and so there's a problem with the whole picture it's not just a problem with which thing we're choosing something is off with what we have historically been doing for the past couple thousand years relative to the christian faith because when we read the Bible, we all are coming up with different ideas. So something's wrong with the overall model, in my estimation. Well, that came to me, and I've been working on it in my mind for a number of years. And you guys have seen elements of this. But this morning, I decided, instead of doing our verse by verse, I'm going to present the model of how we can look at the faith. And from that model, we can say, okay, they are following the faith this way. They are following the faith that way. They are following the faith this way. And by and through those models, we can say whether something would be applicable like women not speaking or not. Okay, so we'll talk all through that as we get going. Um, I think that everything we're gonna talk about is biblically based, if it's not, you know, I just have to admit, something that irritates me is when people talking about things relative to the Christian faith, well, I think, when they say, well, I think, and they don't, uh, and not that they have to say it, but if they say, I think, what they're saying is, I think based off everything that I've studied in Scripture, that. But if it just becomes a, well, I think women should have the right to speak in church, I, it irritates me to no end because everyone has an idea and an opinion of what they think should happen and what shouldn't happen. So what we think is irrelevant. Opinions are irrelevant. What's relevant is what do we have in the scripture that tells us whether our thoughts are correct or not. So before we continue on with verse by verse, which I'm going to do, but from now on, I'm going to teach more in blocks of scripture. In other words, I'll come to chapter 11 of uh, 1 Corinthians and I'll say, this whole block is about, the first half is about women not speaking and women covering their head and men not having long hair. 
Let's see how that block plays out. We'll cover the verses, but it's not going to be so investigative on every single passage because that's a waste of our time. It obviously doesn't have an appeal to us. We obviously don't have to spend two weeks talking about whether we can eat meat offered to idols because we don't have that situation in our world anymore. No one's offering up sacrificial meat to the Rolling Stones and Christians outside the arena aren't saying, can we eat it? That just doesn't happen anymore, right? So we're going to sharpen up a little bit on the verse by verse and hone it in on blocks of scripture and discuss them as a whole and the spiritual messages that we can take from, take from them. Now, most of you know that I operate as a teaching method in what are called heuristic devices. And a heuristic device, in fact, I'll read the, the definition of it. Any procedure which involves the use of an artificial construct to assist in the exploration of a phenomena. So I have heuristics tattooed on my body. These are all heuristic marks that are tattooed on me. And if I'm sitting, working in a public place and someone comes up and has a discussion, they'll say, I really don't know how I can grow in the spirit. I can use this heuristic on my wrist to, and I use it to actually open up to explain to them. And it gives them what that just said. It's an artificial construct to assist in the exploration of phenomena. Okay, another, uh, it usually involves assumptions derived from extent uh, empirical research. So this is actually based off biblical analysis and I created using that thing that looks like a Z, I created this heuristic. It's a tool, it's a model that you can look at and it will help you sort through a mass of information, summarize it, summarize it, summarize it, simmer it down to a workable model that again serves as, an a, 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 as a preliminary analysis for analytical clarity. This is a preliminary analysis of all the information about this topic that this represents and it helps bring analytical clarity. Uh, it also can have explanatory value, a heuristic. So all of these, th I'm going to introduce to you a new heuristic right now. And I'm hoping that it will be of great benefit. Now this morning, we had a great response from the people who saw it and were able to hear what I was talking about. And we've even gotten some emails already from people saying, this blew my mind on how to uh, take all the information we talk about and use it. So uh, as a means to illustrate it, I am calling this heuristic, I'm giving it a very lofty title. And you're going to understand the title once I give it to you. It is the tri-binary model of Christian praxis. Now, Tri-binary, this is really a simple title, okay? Because we know that binary, like bin binary language that computers are created with, you have X's and O's. That's one of the languages they use, right? You have a bunch of, not X's and O's, you have ones and zeros, ones and zeros. And they all form this language that computers somehow understand. That's a two, binary two, two symbol language. So a tri two symbol model means that we're going to have three two symbol models that are going to be combined that are going to help explain Christian praxis which is just another way of how to be how to do Christianity all right that's all it's saying is I have a three two-part model of Christian of how to be a Christian how to do Christianity and I think if this is understood, it's going to lend to us having more love for people who, and the binary language is this, 10, 10, 10. There are three tens, so one, one, two, one, two, one, two, three of them that make up this heuristic, this model, like I have tattooed on my arm to help explain things. In fact, this is going to be my next tattoo. So. Let me present it to you, 
And the beautiful thing about it is it has in its entirety two unique applications, I believe, that are supported by scripture. So uh, I'm going to break it down. And the first part, which has, is, we're just gonna, I'm just going to label these. Number one, creation. And in the creation, we have in the Bible, in Genesis, the fact that God creates all things we say out of nothing. I agree with that. How did he do it? He said it. He spoke it. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke it with words, or what we would call words. And what he said became. I suggest that this whole creation started on the basis of love. God is love. God is light. So it was a creation of light and love, goodness, giving. And God said this, said that, and he created this universe, this world, and then he ultimately created a garden. Now understand that in the creation, when he created this garden, that Genesis tells us it's between the I think it's the Euphrates and the Tigris, and it's, it's a certain area that's actually still existing back in mid, the Middle East somewhere. It's actually where the Garden of Eden is said to be. Now we note that God, he first created the stars and the heavens and the light and the world and everything else, and then he created a garden east of Eden. It wasn't in Eden, it was east of Eden. And this garden was a place where he first places man who was made in his image. The thing that we do not know and we can't, we can hypothecate, we can say whatever, is what happened outside the garden. We don't know. So we don't have any idea what God had done or was doing outside of that area that is described between the Pisces and the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers where the Garden of Eden was. All we read is that God created a garden east of Eden and in that garden, he made man. He made Adam and he made Eve. So we have garden and we have Adam and then he made Eve from his side. And he told Adam uh, before he made Eve, you have dominion over this whole place. He said, Adam, name the animals. Adam, prior to having any knowledge of good or evil, names the animals. Adam has a capacity to understand direction. God said, listen, you can eat of all the trees of this garden. You freely eat, but don't eat of the tree of that free of, uh, fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because if you do, you will surely die. You will die in that day. In the day you eat, you will die. So we have Adam being given instructions. He's able to follow them. We have Eve. She understands what the instructions are. And God gives them a tree. That is forbidden. In this model, you guys, we have the basis, contrary to our, our Calvinistic friends and what I think is one of the most heinous theologies on the face of the universe, is that all the way back to the Garden of Eden, God said, in all this beauty, I'm going to give you a tree. And you can't eat that tree. Don't do it. In the day you do, you're going to surely die. And he gave them the free dumb and the free will to choose to go against him. That's the reason for the tree. He could have given them no opportunity to go against him, and Adam and Eve could have never sinned because everything else was lawful. And so they just go along and they just do what they're going to do, but there's nothing in opposition to tell them, you can go against me if you want. So God says, I'm going to put a tree there. It's really simple. It has fruit on it. That's all I'm doing, a simple tree. Don't eat of it. In the day you do, you will surely die. I don't think there's any power in that tree. I don't think there's anything mystical or magical about it. I think God said, I'll just put one thing that looks enticing. that's going to have fruit on it. Don't eat of that tree. You got pomegranates, you got bananas, you got this, you got that. You have everything in the garden. But the one thing that God says, don't, well, guess what? They want it. That's human nature. So God is playing to the human nature here. He knows that the, he knows what they're going to do, first of all. But he also gives them the freedom to not. Now, people ask, what would happen if they never ate of it? Well, the way I understand it, God said, multiply and replenish the earth. 
So do you know how to do that? Well, look at the animals. We don't know how to do it. God, what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. Oh, okay. And they start having children and more and more people in the garden and the world is populated through an Edenic garden state. Okay. So I don't see any problem with it, but that wasn't what was going to happen, was it? So God gives them this. Creation is number one in seven points that you're going to see in this. What happens is Adam and Eve say, yeah, we want to do our own will. We want to do what we feel like doing. We don't want to show God we love and trust him. This is the model for all of us, you guys. It hasn't changed. We want to do it our way. God tells me don't, you know, grab the neighbor's wife. Eh, I want to, God, so I'm gonna. It's the same, same principle. God tells us we do it. Same principle. Well, he says don't do it, and they do it. So we have number two, and we call that the fall. All right? The fall of Adam and the choice to not show God that you love him, but to show God that you love yourself and your ideas more. Willful rebellion against him, key to all human relations, even today. Today, just consider yourself in a Garden of Eden, even though it's not really, and there's people who say, I want to do what God wants me to do, and there's people who say, I don't care. It's the same thing. Same model, okay? <clears throat> I want you to notice something about the fall. It, Paul says that Eve was, begot Eve, Eve was the one who was tricked, but Adam wasn't. They both fell or went against God's will before the fall. Did you notice that? Eve made a choice before she was evil because of the fall to take of that fruit of her own accord. And Adam, before he fell into sin and darkness and everything, he made the choice to go against what God had said. I'm pointing that out because what that tells us is that within humanity, there's enough darkness to choke a horse. It's part of our nature. Before a fall, we have an ability to choose and we choose our own will. Why? We're not God. We're human. We're creations. All right? So at this time, right here, we enter in to a, what the Jews called the present age. And you can see in this present age that we have our first 10. There's the first binary language of the model, our first 10. And in this, what we have is after Noah, we have Abraham and we have Isaac and we have Jacob and we have the 12 tribes of Israel. And from the 12 tribes, we become the children of Israel. And God says, okay, I tried with Adam and Eve to disobey me. I gave them a garden. I gave them everything. This was the first model, a created being following me of their own will. No, 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 not going to do it. Doesn't work with humans. So God says, okay, let me do it another way. From Adam and Eve, I'm going to create children of Israel. Were there other nations outside of this? Of course there were, just like there were other places outside the Garden of Eden. Outside the children of Israel, there were other nations, okay? But God said of this specific nation, I'm going to work with them, and I'm going to make them my people. And he says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And he gives them this whole rigmarole, right? And he tells them, listen, I am going to make you a great nation and you are going to worship me. This is a big word in the model, externally. Why are they, how and why are they going to worship him externally? Because he is going to give them laws. The Jews say there's uh, 316 of them. He's going to give them prophets, external material prophets, who will speak his will to them. He's going to give them scripture, which was written in material stone and on papyrus. And he's going to give them the promise of a material Messiah. All external, all material. 
this part of this first tri-binary model, the first part of the first tri-binary model, is all externally driven. And it's God telling them, listen. Oh, he also gave them a temple that was external. That actually began as a tabernacle and then came to Mount Moriah and had an actual physical, material place where they would go and they would kill material animals and shed their material blood and to give them uh, uh, coverage by these animal sacrifices, right? So they, the Jews, were always in anticipation of an age to come. They were always looking for that age where they could be released from under the bondage of external material religion. They knew it was coming. And they, so they said, we are in the present age, but we look for the age to come. And in their mind, with that age to come was going to come that material Messiah. And he was going to lead them into an age where the nation of Israel was going to dominate the world and they would no longer be under oppression, etc., etc. So here is really the first of, ten, of the three tens. And there are people who see their faith in God through this first binary model. They say that we can still appeal to God through his laws, that there are still prophets, they are still giving scripture, that uh, the Messiah... Uh, has yet to come, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they are called Jews. Some of them are actually Muslims. And we might even take Mormons to a certain extent and say they are greatly part of this, maybe not entirely. They mix the next age to come in. But these are all the things that, that these are the groups that they look to the faith in the first ten. All right? Well, guess what? This Messiah came as promised, and this is going to give us the beginning of our second ten. Here he came. He did not come at the end of this age. Over here, this is the way most people see it, is that Jesus came right here. He came before the end of this age. And he began his teachings that are found in the Gospels of the New Testament. And sharing, and part of his message, you know this, was that the end of this age is coming. Right? So, with Jesus coming, he not only came in the last part of this present age, but he also inaugurated... A new age. His birth inaugurated the new age. And so when you read the New Testament, you read about this new thing coming. We call it the good news because it was great news to those Jews. It's good news. Christ our Messiah has come. It's the gospel, the good news. Today we read it and we still think that it is talking about us now, when you read contextually in the New Testament narrative, it's all centered around Jesus coming to them and giving his life and having his apostles reach them. We're going to get to our part in just a second. Okay? So this was the initiation of the age to come. And in it was the beginning of the end of this age. It was the beginning of the end of it. And how people read scripture and don't see this, I really don't understand. Um, the, New Test the Old Testament was not over. The New Testament, here's the thing, had just sort of been introduced, but it wasn't in full effect yet. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to come to these people 
and he came and he brought the good news. Now, what was the good news? The message was, if you believe on me, you will be saved. The saved in context was you'll be saved from Sheol, if you believe on me, thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. To the Pharisees, how are you gonna escape hell? So Sheol was still a place, Sheol, the covered place, hell. It was still a place in Jesus' day. If you believe on me, you'll escape Sheol, you'll go to Abraham's bosom. And if you believe on me, you will escape being destroyed when the end of this age comes. So look to me, believe and live was his message. And then he said to the Jews in Matthew 22, how will you escape the damnation of, Gen of Gehenna? How are you going to escape the fires of Gehenna, he says. Why? It was a literal, actual destruction headed their way. And he couldn't believe that they were so hard-hearted that they couldn't receive him. So when the New Testament, primarily through Jesus and his apostles, not necessarily Paul, but his apostles talk about they go to different places and they say, believe and be saved. They are talking about saved from the coming promised destruction, which would culminate in the end of this age. That's the, that's the way and that's what's being said. That was their message. That was good news. That was really good news. Those who didn't believe on the son, who were of the house of Israel, died. They went to the prison part of Sheol, which was miserable, dark covered place. Those who believed on him and died before the end, they went to paradise like the thief on the cross, Abraham's bosom. They were saved from that punishment. They were also, if they lived to the end, when Jesus said he was coming back for his bride, he, they said he, uh, they were uh, saved from the physical destruction where over a million Jews were slaughtered and destroyed. All right. So the interesting thing is you see this little area right in here is that when Jesus came, he didn't come preaching elements of this age. He came fulfilling elements of this age. He came preaching something else. When John came, he baptized with water. Jesus calls him the last of the prophets and the law. And John came baptizing with water. Why? Because that's an external expression that was all part of that present age of the Jew. And Jesus was prophesied as needing baptism. He came to fulfill all things. So Jesus steps forward and John Baptist baptizes him with water. But you know what John said? He said, man, I come to baptize with water, but the one who's coming after me, I'm not worthy to even tie his shoe. He is coming and baptizing with the Holy Spirit and with fire. This is a completely invisible, different way of living. So yes, we are doing water baptisms in John's name for a while here. And yes, Jesus is allowing all that. But that was all part of this age. It's not part of the age to come. The age to come is what Jesus integrates here. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Here is the second 10. It's kind, of a, uh, it's kind of a strange O, but it starts with his birth, his, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, all Jesus. And then we have this age of the, of the, of the age to come merging with the former age. And right here in the middle is the New Testament church. Okay? Now, uh, we might consider this the Old Testament view. And that's number, the first 10. We might consider this the New Testament view, and it's the second 10 of the heuristic, all right? The New Testament was not completely the former age. The New Testament was not completely, and if you don't get this, you're gonna be practicing it today in the New Testament church. 
you're going to be practicing something that doesn't apply. It wasn't completely old, it wasn't completely new, it was right here at the intersection of the two. And it was purposeful in order to wipe out everything here and introduce everything there. And it happened right in this narrow bit of time that was governed by Jesus and his apostles before they were killed. When they were killed, it ended it. Why? There was no more need for those guys who actually traveled with Jesus, saw his miracles, were taught by Jesus, wrote of Jesus, and called to the nation of Israel to repent and become ready for his return. It wasn't necessary at all. Now we don't need them. Still, there are people today who think that this part continues on and on. They act like there's the intersection point is right here and, there, and there's no overflow between the two. They're absolutely missing the point. So this world, when the new thing Jesus introduces here clashes with the old thing and they oversect in this period of time, which really was, folks, truly was about 40 years, which is a biblical generation, that period of time was horrendous. This is when the contents of Matthew 22 and 23 and 24, this is when the contents of Revelation are getting thrown down. This is where the tribulation was happening. This is where Nero was putting people to death as the Antichrist. This is where all the fulfillments come and due. And it's all for a purpose to see the end of this former age where Paul says everything in it, this is from Paul, has to fall and crumble before this age can be fully understood. You see? So New Testament ideas that were still existing here in all the Old Testament laws, prophets, temple, uh, all these external things have to go away. Which is why at the end of this age, right here, we have the destruction of Jerusalem. It happens right here. This is the last 10. It's made by this and it gives us this and that right there. This last 10 is known by the end time view superimposing itself over that. When it does, you have the correct view of what, what we're in now. Okay. So it was promised here, all these things are going to wipe out this and Paul says, once the last thing has lost, we have 1.1 million Jews going. We have a temple that is fully destroyed. We have a priesthood that is eradicated off the face of the earth. We have genealogy, material genealogy, gone again off the face of the earth. All of it gone. We have the end. And that was in 70 AD. And so now you can say, well, I can understand how people have their Christianity. There are people who are first 10 people. There are people who are second 10 people. This is most of the Christian church today. Most of the Christian church today says, I read the New Testament. I believe it. That's what it says. That's what we're in. And we're just waiting for all of it to apply. So when we study 1 Corinthians and it says women shouldn't speak at church, well, we should take that seriously and women should cover their head, we should take that seriously. Not realizing it was purposeful and it was for that age right there. What was gonna be, what was gonna be taken from that age? Well, let me just begin with this. A reality, because this is still part of the former age, a reality of this age right here was, let me just put it right here, Sheol, hell, was a reality. That's why Jesus talked about it to his own. Satan was a reality. That's why Jesus talked about Satan. Satan came and did things. All a reality of this segment right here in that New Testament church that the apostles were over to govern through until he returned. Also part of this reality, right? And so when you read the Bible, you, you realize that Satan is a reality. Death, spiritual death and separation from God was a reality. all realities of those two economies. 
And so when you read the Bible, that's a history of those things happening. We say those were realities. So it must be a re reality for us here. No, no, no. You make way too far of a jump. So death and Satan, separation from God, tribulation, end of the world, end of the age, all realities of this time. And so they're addressed in that. We read it today and, and we just simply haven't been able to get ourselves to say, this doesn't make sense anymore relative to what the rest of scripture says. We can do it when we talk about women covering their heads in church. We can do it when it comes to women speaking in church. We've already made progress in that way and we said, well, that we can do. But when we look at certain other things, we say, no, 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 those could not possibly be over with. They're not just cultural. They're, they're doctrinal. Not so. And we know this because of the description, descriptions of this great news age that we are presently in and have been in since 70 A.D. What happened was in 70 AD, the people who were alive and they weren't taken and they were part of the church outside of Jerusalem when it was destroyed, thought that we were still doing this. And they perpetuated that. Now you ask yourself, what has happened to the Christian church since that time? What has happened to it? I, uh, Chuck Smith, the guy I mentored under at Calvary Chapel, who started Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith said succinctly, church history stinks stinks why because from this point forward we have tried to replicate what goes on here and that's why it stinks because it was never meant to be what Jesus was doing here and I'm going to use a word from these people is he was calling a group of believers who were under apostolic rule to be his bride. Now you remember at the beginning, Adam and Eve, God gave Adam a bride, Eve, right? And from them they populated all the nation of Israel, right? And all the whole world apparently is as we read it, right? Well, the, the, the New Testament calls Jesus the second Adam. And he has introduced to us the, the one who has brought forth a bride out of the people who lived in that narrow 40-year period of time. Who were they? They were, began as Jews. And those Jews were faithful. 144,000 of them it's talked about. They weren't, didn't even defile themselves with women. They were people who lost their lives for the faith. They were people who were tormented and went hungry, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why all the revelation and the other uh, apostolic appeals to support them say, hang on, hang on, hang on. He's coming to get us. Be faithful. Don't lose your first faith. And if you do, there's a reward. And then it's described as the bride coming to take his bride, the second Adam, to take his bride. And then Jesus and his bride do what? They populate the rest of the body that is over here in this new age. They are the ones, we, we come from them. We are not the bride of Christ anymore. That is something that was created by a guy named Schofield and Darby to perpetuate futurism and dispensationalism. But bottom line, the bride was taken by Christ back in 70 AD before the ending of that generation and they were uh, taken up to heaven to establish what's called the New Jerusalem. So, let me just finish this part up. In the bride, as we caught, covered this a few weeks ago, there were firstborn, there were firstfruits of many. Outside the bride, there are many children. That are, those are the people who have come to Christ and been his since 70 AD to this very day. This kingdom that Jesus established here at his birth, life, death, resurrection, and he started it off, goes on forever. It is an eternal kingdom. And um, it goes on 
aeons and aeons forever. And we don't believe that anymore because we have fallen under the spell that this model actually looks like this. Old Testament, New Testament, end of times. And this is when the kingdom will go on spiritually. And so we're waiting for this. And the New Testament began with Jesus' birth right here in the middle. And it's going to go on until he comes back. This, is, this, this model shows that that is quite a different picture than what the Bible, I think, clearly shares. So we enter into this uh, phase of the New Testament. And this is where, when the Bible talks about people being predestined, you know where it talks about that God has predestined some to do this? Do you know what, who he's talking about there? The Calvinists take those passages and they apply them to themselves out here. But it, it, it was talking about those in this window of time. Because the letter that it is written in was written to them in that time. That God had predestined some of them to be the uh, believers in the church at that time to be carried forward until the end. So when you read scripture for, with this view, you're able to explain things like predestination and all those issues that come up that men and women have errantly applied to this future age. There were strict guidelines for this small, narrow church. And those guidelines um, were given by the apostles. And they were always couched in, do this until he comes. That includes communion. Do this until he comes. He comes, hang on, be, t be safe, be strong. They were strict and they would get rid of people because those people weren't following the guidelines and therefore were endangering Jesus' bride who was coming out of that small group. They had to keep the church together because Jesus said, I will establish my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That was possible with a small group 12 apostles leading it. That was not possible afterward. We have not seen a church yet uh, materially where the gates of hell haven't prevailed against it in some way or another because we're not in that age anymore. So they were all for that time apostolically derived ordered commandment as a means to get them through. And then he promises to come to this third line, which as I've said, is the end of the age. And so we see that Jesus came and he came while this age was still in place, right? And then we see that he returned while to end this age and while this age was still in place. That window of time is his church. Now, there are people today, most Christians today see themselves as living right here. And so they use the Bible as a text for laws. Laws that were written to the church back then for them. And they'll, they'll read it and they'll say, well, it says this about that. And they totally ignore what the scripture says his kingdom will be like once he's returned and finished everything. They completely ignore those passages. Why? Because they think we haven't gotten there yet. But we have arrived. And the reason we know that is because these ways are not working and have not worked for 2,000 years. That's why we have denominations. That why, that's why we have infighting. That's why we have Christians not loving as the way they should. Because the rule of thumb for this age is love. It is totally love. Why? Because we are not lawyers. If you are part of this New Testament age, if this is how, in, the, in the second 10, if you see yourself as just part of this, it's impossible for you to love. When you read Paul telling that you should be excommunicating people and you should be uh, doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that, you have to say love comes secondary. Staying together is primary. You can't love in the presence of a multiplicity of laws. There's 3,000, over 3,015 laws in the New Testament. Rules that you're supposed to follow. They were never meant for us. They were just meant for them. We read it today and we say, okay, this is how you do church. You know, and you start applying the rules. And I gave this this morning. I'll do it again because it's effective. You know, 
let's just say here at campus, I'm sorry you guys who come here a lot, you know this, but here at campus we have absolutely no rules at all. There's no rules at the campus. You can speak when you want, you can get up and leave, you can pay, pay money to it, you cannot, you can live with your girlfriend or boyfriend or both, you can do whatever you want at campus. It's open to you, right? But there's this one thing we've decided. And I, I'm sorry for the redundancy. It's the only thing I can think of because it applies to my life. And that is you must wear socks to campus. You have to wear socks to campus. That's the only thing we have here, but it's an important rule. So uh, we just have to tell you that's one rule we're going to take. You must wear socks. So next week, people show up to campus. And we're going to have, you know, all the people who want to please God through their outward uh, affectations be wearing socks. But we're going to have a couple rebels. Rex is going to be one of them. And not going to wear socks. I wouldn't wear socks. I made the rule and I'm not wearing them. Like Jim Jones, make a rule and then break it yourself. So what's going to happen is you're going to have people who obey the rule, feeling that they are really pleasing to God, and they're going to be looking at people who disobey the rule and they're going to say, they're not, they're not being good. And you're going to have people who are disobeying the rule and saying, we're free in Christ. And they're going to be looking at those who are wearing socks and, and saying, stupid, sheep. So you automatically have this. Two weeks from now, we're going to have people who are going to start to fix their socks up. Women love to adorn themselves, little trinkets and golds and, and jewels sewn into the socks, Armani socks. Kmart socks, division on socks. You have people wearing black socks only, people wearing white socks in 100 years. You're going to have a division of sock wearers in campus alone based off one stupid single rule. This is why Paul was so strong on how we don't look to those things anymore. Now, and when he, when he broke some of his own rules, it was because it's in this context that he broke them because he's an apostle to keep that church together till Christ came and took it. But when we read it, we call ourselves biblical Christians and we read what's written here for the New Testament and then we combine what's written here in the Old, we become the biggest law keepers. There's 3,015 commandments here. There's 316 commandments according to an Orthodox Jew here. You cannot have the presence of law and love. You can't do it. Law makes you a sinner. It will make you feel righteous or it will make you feel unrighteous, but either way, you will be a sinner in the face of law. And so what God gave us was an age of total, consummate grace. Complete. Separate from all of that stuff that we read in written words. I am not against the Bible. I've developed the model from knowing the Bible. I love it. But when you use it as a template to make your arguments for point by point, you fail to understand what Jesus came and gave his life for. That he saved the cosmos world, saved the world. That is, as Dave put it, the great news. It was good news that Jesus came to his own and he saved them from hell and he saved them from imminent destruction that was headed their way. It's great news thereafter when that was completed here with his second coming. It's great news hereafter because no more, scripture says, does a man need to teach his neighbor, know the Lord, know the Lord for all will know him. You don't need to come to campus to learn to know the Lord. You can know him on your own. You know, by reading your scripture, you can read them by not, you can read them by prayer. You can read, you can know him, the spirit's moving in your life. The good, the good news is I have come and saved you Jews from as your Messiah. The great news is I have saved the world. So you're on the bus and, and you have a lesbian, um, transvestite, child molester, uh, 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 felon sitting next to you. You can easily say to them, did you know Jesus saved you from Sheol? It's been tossed. Did you know Jesus saved you from Satan? Satan's been overcome. Did you know that you've been saved by Jesus? Oh yeah, I've heard all that religious stuff. I know if I do repent. No, 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 no. You don't, you're, 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 you're listening to it from this perspective. 
No, you misunderstand. The great news is you have been reconciled to the heavenly place. If you want to be in relationship with God, you can. That's up to you. If you don't, you don't have to. Because when we read in, in Revelation 21, it simply says there are two destinations. There's two destinations now in this age of grace. One is in the New Jerusalem, which is heavenly, and that's where people who believe are with God in Christ, and Christ is the light of that place. That's the one place, and then outside of it is the other place. And there's, wall, and there's holes in the walls of the Great Jerusalem that are open day and night, and people outside of it can come in. I mean, there's no more, the punishment's been paid 2,000 years ago for you, and the judgment's been heaped upon them uh, 1,940 years ago for you, so that's all done. The, the great news is you are saved. So what do you have to kick against? Jesus loved the world so much. He loved you. You're his. How am I his the way I am? Well, he, he saved you in your sin. He saved you while you were yet a sinner. What, but, 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 and you say, well, how about this passage? How about that? Oh, well, you know, we're talking about context here. But let's just talk about the great news and what has happened. Because over here, Paul has about 14 scriptures, and so does Peter, and so does James and John, that describe this age. Hebrews does it really well. We've spent a lot of time in that in Revelation. And in that age, God says, I will write my laws upon their minds and upon their hearts. That's what he says. He doesn't say, I'll write my laws in a book. He says, I'll write my laws on their minds and in their heart. And I will be their God, and they'll be my people. That's what he says. He says, that in the former times, before this comes into play, he says, I'm going to shake everything on heaven and earth one more time. So much that nothing that can be shaken can remain. Why? So the only thing that can remain cannot be shaken, and those are spiritual things known by the Spirit that live in heavenly places. Nothing to do with this external material uh, religion anymore. We don't teach it. You know why? Because... As churches, we want to take the manual and use it in these ways because it keeps people in the pews and it keeps people feeling like there's things they must do in order to be loving to God. And I'm not making this gospel truth. I'm just appealing to it just because I've been exposed to it recently. But I talked to a couple people and they're talking about these after near-death experiences, real legitimate ones, doctor verified. And these people are saying, I died. I'm not religious. And I went to this glorious place and I saw a city and something in me said, you've got to get to that city. You've got to get to that. And there are people all around me. Revelation just says there's two places. There's, there's that city, the New Jerusalem, with gates in it that are open day and night. And outside of it are the liars, the reprobates, those people who love abomination. They're living outside of it. The light is within the city and might get darker as you get outside further and further from the city. I don't know. But it doesn't say anything about punishment there. Hell's been cast in. Doesn't say anything about Satan there. He's over with. Doesn't say anything about death reigning. Death has been overcome. This new age is, is new aeon is, is what God and, uh, promised. It's a kingdom that will go on forever. And people have been added to it and taken, maybe not taken from it, but maybe added to it for centuries upon centuries of time. This is Jesus having the victory. This is him having the reign over all things. It's not, it's too much for us. It's too much. Why? Because it gives us this word we really don't want. Freedom. It's the same freedom that existed over here for Adam and Eve. They had one commandment. Don't eat of the tree. Multiply, replenish the earth. Don't eat of the tree. Two. We have one commandment in this new age. Love God. Love each other. That's it. Two. In between, we have commandment ad nauseum. It doesn't work. So God said, I'm going to start it off with this. I'm going to bring this model in. I'm going to bring around this and actually fix everything right here through my son and his bride. And that bride and my son are going to have children. and They're going to be part of the, the body of Christ forevermore. And it's going to operate on love and grace because my son will have had the victory over all people, all times, as he's had the victory over death, as he's had the victory over Satan, as he's had the victory over Sheol. He's had the victory. The question is, what age do you want to live in? What view? Do you want to live in the first 10? Do you want to live in the second 10? Do you want to live in the, uh, the third 10? Which one of the model do you want to live in? 
most people who say they're Christian cannot get outside of this tin right here. Some of them go so far as to say, I also want to add this, so I'm a 20-er. I'm a 20. I, I got 20, not just a 10. I add the law, too. I know some people who have left this tin and added the other tin because it makes them more holy. They are now become Judaizers for the law as they are followers of Christ. Okay? I say you move into this model right here that is defined by this eschatology and you move into this place of great grace and great love where Christ has had the victory and reward is now given and here's the thing that please don't lose this rewards are all given everyone is rewarded in this economy with what well you're rewarded here with what you do in the flesh you save your money you're rewarded with compounded interest and you'll have money here there is a reward you don't then you're not rewarded here okay same thing there if you have lived in this age in spiritual things if you sow to the spirit you will reap to the spirit if you sow to the flesh you will reap to the flesh here but you won't there it's all reward system it's all meritorious depending on what you want and that's why so many of those people in the near-death experience said in that city i had my own house i had a place in that city i have to get to it it's my place created out of what created out of what they sowed to while they were in this life so it's not that Hitler gets to go and be in heaven because he's just as loved and everything as the Christian person who gave their life out of humble sacrifice and love for others. Hitler will go outside the city gates, but he has the opportunity to get in. Maybe it's a long journey for him. Maybe he's far from the light. I don't know the answers to that. The scripture doesn't tell us. But what it does tell us is there's only two places, in the city or outside of it. And the walls are open in the city to come in any time. It also tells us, don't kid yourself, you will uh, reap what you have sown. I believe in that. So that's the reason why you want to come to know Christ in this day and age, while you're alive here. Because you have a relationship with him who is in the New Jerusalem. You're part of it. It begins here and it continues on there. All right? So first, first 10 is um, Old Testament. Second 10 is either just new or new and old. And the third ten is the new aeon established by Christ through his birth, life, death, and resurrection. Now, before we wrap it up, I just want to share one thing with you. One more thing with you. Wendy, you're not doing your job. Oh, I must do everything here. Do I have to run the TriCaster? Do I have to push the buttons? I just gave you what I believe, truly believe, through uh, decades of seeking and studying the Word of God, and that's just the only thing I can say, I could be wrong, I have to always say I can be wrong, is that what we have here, what I just shared with you, begins one, with creation, two, with the fall, three, with the children of Israel, four, with Jesus coming, Five with the, I mean, uh, five with the New Testament narrative by the apostles and Jesus. Six with the end of that age. And seven with uh, the new aeon. Okay, I hate to say new age because it's loaded with sin. That is the biblical model that I suggest to you. The beautiful thing about this to me is that all these same things, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, exist for us individually. And what I mean by that is I think God 
has given us a template through the biblical model and that template is applied to us as individuals and let me quickly just explain it. We are all born as creations, creatures. We too come into this world prior to knowing our sinfulness. We, are, we enter into the world as creatures, uh, products of our mom and dad. And all of us, at some point in our existence, experience our own fall. Now, it might be when we are one and we are just rebellious and angry and spitting and crying over everything. It might, we might have been good little kids and we, you know, it, it might be we're never selfish, but suddenly we become it. It might be when, you know, you're eight and you decide to steal something for the first time. You may have been born a rat or you may become a rat, but in the end, you, we all experience as creations our own fall. What happens is typically in society and by our parents is that number three, which represents the children of Israel, God creating a nation with laws and rituals and temples and all these other things, scripture, is that for us, three is represented by our parents putting us in Boy Scouts. I call it the institutional approach. And they put us in Boy Scouts. They put us in, uh, they put me in junior lifeguards in Huntington Beach because that was a, a, a public program. They get us involved in school activities. They put us in sports that discipline us. They put us in paramilitary groups, whatever it is. They may put us in a church that gives us all sorts of, that's what my parents did. They joined the Mormon church. They said, our kids are creatures. They're, they're all fallen little rats. We're gonna put them in the Mormon church so that they can learn some rules about how to behave in society. We all get there. The interesting thing about it is in the seven point individual walk is I think, cause scripture says it, we all know that we have a need of number four here. We have a need of a Messiah. We know we've done things wrong. We know we can't help ourselves. And we know that we wanna fill that void within us. And so in this model, I would suggest that when people see themselves as needing, however old you are, when you see and you reach out and you call out, you can find your Savior one way or another. If you find your Savior, Jesus Christ, you enter into number five, which we're just calling the New Testament experience. What happens when you come to find Jesus? As an individual, you realize that you've fallen, you've sinned, that churches don't work, and you've now found Jesus and you enter into this. What happens is you begin to read the Bible and you start going to church. And you start having pastors tell you their vision of the church. It's the same thing right here. It's this narrow little spot that almost all Christians have to enter. They experience religion in Jesus' name. It's not that much different than it, this religion over here full of laws. It's a little more liberal, but you enter into it, okay? I would suggest in this model applied that everybody push toward the place where Jesus returns in their life. And he comes and he takes them up to the new Jerusalem. He saves you from this. You don't stay in it. Of course, there's people who love this. They stay in it. There's people who stay in this. But I suggest that the true freedom lies in pushing the boundaries and having your own end time experience where in your life you realize all of religion is over. It comes by the spirit. It comes by seeking for God in spirit and truth. When that happens, you move from this into number seven. You move into the age of grace. And when you aren't going to a church that demands you are protesting against the Democrats or the Republicans or the gays or the lesbians or you're not doing, when you leave churches that are trying to impose this stuff upon you and you say, no, my Jesus has done everything. He's had the victory. I'm going to accept that. You move into a world that is radical and it is liberating and it's beautiful and it's hard because when you have turned your back on everything that this stuff has to do religion and institutions and you say i am now part of the new jerusalem which is on high i don't have to look to a man for my guidance i now have a direct relationship with god i believe everybody 
that God loves them all and Jesus saved them all. When you start saying stuff like that, you will then enter into what happened with Jesus when he started preaching the fullness of this kingdom. He ended up outside the city gates. He ended up hanging on a cross naked. He ended up alone. And who wants that, right? Not many. You have to start thinking for yourself between you and Christ. You have to start believing that he is truly in charge, not your pastor, not them playing church. And we don't want that. So we step back into the confines and the, and the safety of this. Ah, oh, yeah, we are truly following the New Testament model. I'm a New Testament believer. Right. I would love to sit down with you and show how you are not doing that. Or, yes, and I am also following this. I am a full Bible believer. I bet you are. But this is what God wants for us. He wants us, as Hebrews 6 says, to move into perfection. That means completion. And where we set aside, we set aside repentance from dead works. We set aside faith in Christ. That's a quote from Hebrews. We set aside all of that with the foregone conclusion that it has been done. I'm going to end right now by telling you, you want the radical living by faith, which is the only way we can please God. You radically live by faith when you step in over here and you say, this is my, my approach to the faith. This, the third 10. This is it. You are stepping uh, less faith here. You're kind of a mix between faith and law when you step here. And then here you just total law thinking that this is the way to do it. And that, that, that's not the answer, but if you want to do it, if, that's your choice, right? If you really want to know how to love, you really want to love as God is love, you enter in his kingdom here and you love unconditionally. You don't need these guys to tell you how to love and when to love and where to love. You love as God loves. You don't let this define you anymore in your faith. So we have simply put the, uh, the 10, 10, 10 model. And that's the par that's not the paradigm. That is the heuristic. It's going to be my next tattoo. And, uh, and I think it tells us how to look at the faith. Now, when you, as a Christian who is living over here in the far side, see people stuck here, you're going to love them. You're not going to fight them and criticize them. And when you see people stuck here, you're going to love them. They will fight and criticize you. You love them back. That's part of being in this age of grace being filled with this Christian love, being emancipated from other people and their religious ideas.